Father, we thank you again for this day and allowing us to all wake up and experience more life with you, Father. New mercies, Father. More of your long suffering, more of your great, more of your goodness, more of you. You are perfect in every way. In a world that is dark, you are the light. And Father, in a world that is evil, Father, you are good. Therefore, every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord. So we thank you for the greatest gift, which was your son, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we will truly, truly have a heart after you. Despite the things we experience and go through, let our heart be fixed, let our heart be determined, and let our heart be sold on you and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Indeed, it is a good morning. God is always good. Who still got leftovers in their refrigerator? Is is Sunday to cut off dates? Are we are we going for a week? Are we going for a week? Sunday is a cut off date. All right, Amen. Amen. Thank God. Um, good to see everybody this morning. Good to be seen. Um, it's eleven forty. I think I can get this lesson in 20 minutes in my head. <laughs> you have to laugh like that, no mind. <laughs> you laughing harder now. <laughs> Supposed to be my, it'd be your own people. <laughs> in my head, I know where I want to go and I know the points I want to make, but uh, nevertheless, let the word be proclaimed today. And, um, I'm very thankful for this holiday, and um, I want to show my appreciation to my leadership team tonight for this PM. So I think the reason why I want to be quick is because I want to split this text in half. So I'm going to give you the first half this morning, and I'll give you the second half, God willing, tonight or this uh, afternoon. So uh, we'll just deal with verses 1 through 13. So I'm going to, uh, I want to thank Zion for reading, because the last time I was before you uh, to preach, I came from 1 Samuel 13, where God rejects Saul as his king. Because Saul, like many of us, got impatient, right? And you guys know that, that, that right when we're getting close to the end, that's when we get the most impatient, right? We talked about senioritis. Right in school, right before you're about to graduate, right before the school year is over, that's when you get the most impatient, right? And then you start getting antsy, and sometimes you do things that you know you normally wouldn't do, right? Um, so because Saul got impatient, right, he offered up a sacrifice to God when that was not his job, that was the priest's job, that was Samuel's job. So, so God said, you know what, man. It's, it's, it's not just that you sinned, it's your response to the sin. And what I want us to see this morning is that God is seeking people whose heart is after him, and it's not based upon being flawless and perfect, right? It's based upon being real, right? And it's based upon your response when you fall, right? See, we, we, we know in sports, right, nobody goes perfect, right? Nobody goes on, except the 72 Dolphins, the NFL 72 Dolphins. Right. Nobody goes perfect. That, that's a once in a lifetime. Right. And it'll probably never happen again. Yeah. Right. Uh, but nobody really goes perfect. And, and what God is seeking after is how do you respond when you fall? Amen. Right. Yeah. How do you respond when you mess up? Yeah. Right. Because guess what? We gonna mess up. Amen. You and I are going to mess up. So God wants people who are whose heart is after his. So that's the lesson up front. Right. And now as we go through the word, I'm going to encourage you to make your own application. So as we go to first uh, Samuel, chapter 15, you guys are going to need your Bibles because we are going to walk through this first Samuel, chapter 15. And I will try to do verses one through 13 only. And I will save the latter part for the evening p.m. God willing. While you're turning there, um, I just want to take this time to acknowledge my church family, my spiritual family. Right, because you guys have been a true family to me and, and my family for a long time now, and um, today is actually the 20-year anniversary of my father's passing. Right, so 
I was 20 years old when he passed. So that means for me, he's been dead the same amount of years he's been alive in my life. And back in 2003, this was actually Thanksgiving Day, right? My father passed on the Thanksgiving holiday. But what I'm thankful for is that uh, God is a father to the fatherless, right? God is truly a father to the fatherless. And he never leaves us empty or without void. And so God, through his kingdom and through his family, through the body of Christ, has blessed me to have some spiritual father figures. So God is truly good. God is truly good, right? Uh, Even when times are dark, even when your heart hurts, even when your head hurts, when your body hurts, God is good. Do I got a witness this morning? Because God God knows how to deliver those in those times. God knows how to rescue those of us in those times, right? We talked about it this morning in class. Brother Kearney asked a, a very profound question, right? Very practical yet profound, right? If you offer someone some food, right, and, 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 and they smack the food out your hand and the coffee's hot and it spills on your lap, what would you do, right? And, and you know, we got, we, you know how we do. We get a Bible answer. Well, you know, you know, right? But all through my head, I was thinking about that dog pound song, what would you do, right? 80s and 90s babies know what I'm talking about, right? But see, God knows how to deliver and rescue us out of those times of peril, right? God just wants our heart to be connected to his heart. So King Saul started off with very humble beginnings, but King Saul lost himself along the way. Now, will you guys join me in 1 Samuel chapter 15? And I'm going to start reading in verse number 1, and I'm going to give us a little history lesson along the way. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now, the Bible says, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people, Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. The first thing Samuel does is remind Saul that, look, God sent me to anoint you. So this word that I'm about to tell you is straight from God, right? The first thing we can do is respect what comes out of the mouth of the man of God. Right? We have a tendency sometimes to judge the messenger, right? I don't like the way that was packaged, or I don't like the way, it, I don't like him, or I don't like her. Right, right. If the word is from God and God's people, listen and take heed, yeah. period. So Saul, Samuel says, this is a message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now, let's go back in time and do some history. Amen? Now, God led his people out of Egyptian bondage. Now, as soon as they came out of Egyptian bondage, they went right back into the desert wilderness. And they said, Moses, why would you bring us out here to die? Right? Right? We could have stayed in Egypt and we would have been okay, even though we were in bondage. We're thirsty. So, so God told Moses, okay, take the rod and go smite the rock. Y'all remember this? And water flowed from the rock, from the rock, right? Now, immediately after that, the Amalekites attacked the Israelites. Fresh off of coming out of Egyptian bondage, now the Amalekites want to pick a fight with the Israelites, So I'm going to take you back to Exodus 17, and I will read it for you. Exodus 17, 8 says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Go get some men. I'm I'm, I'm, going to just talk it out. Is that okay? Moses said to Joshua, Go get some boys. Go get some goons, right? And let's go to war, right? So they went and got some boys and some goons, and they went to war. You remember this? Now, whenever Moses would lift up his arms... They'd be successful. Remember that? But when he get tired, then they would start to lose. So the people said, okay, well, let's sit him down and let's help lift him up and raise his arms. And the people were successful. Right. So Joshua and, and defeated the Amalekites with the sword. And on that day, they proclaimed this day as a, 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 a sign that Moses builds an altar. And then he calls God Yahweh Nisi, Jehovah Nisi. Meaning, the Lord is my banner, 
the Lord is my victory flag in him. He is my victory. He is where I get my confidence from. But then listen to what God says. I want you to hear exactly what God says. God lets them know that because the Amalekites chose to attack my people, oh, I ain't going to forget about it. See, remember we was kids, we were told elephants don't forget. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember elephants don't forget? I ain't the only one, right? Now, history has shown us that elephants do have a, a strong memory, right? If you, if, you, if you taught an elephant, throw something at it, or kid, elephants remember, right? And we see people getting trampled in their cars, messing with elephants, right? But I want y'all to know something. God don't forget. God remembers. God keeps score. Now, I know he's a loving God and a forgiving God, so when he forgives, he wipes it out. But when you play with God and you play with God's people, oh, he don't take that lightly. So now, fast forward to 1 Samuel chapter 15. God said, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they came out of Egypt. That's 400 years ago. So God said, y'all thought, I, they thought I forgot. But guess what? I got something for them, right? Y'all know that was the worst thing as a kid. When, you, when I thought I could get home and I thought about, come on, somebody. I was hoping my parents forgot what I did. I was hoping they forgot that voicemail from the teacher. I was hoping they forgot. But the parent, come on, Bishop Snowball. Y'all remember House Party 1? He tried to sneak back in the bed at the end of the movie. He said, don't get in that bed just yet. Right? You thought I forgot. So God said, this is the message from Samuel to Saul. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel 400 years ago. Approximately. Now go and attack the Amalekites. Pay attention. Go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything. Some of you have heard to say utterly destroy. This is repeated multiple times in this chapter. Utterly destroy. Totally destroy. Is that clear enough for y'all? Does it make sense? Go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put, ooh, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle, sheep, Camels, donkeys, kill everything, utterly destroy everything. Now, some people read this and say, what kind of God would destroy infants, kids, and children? A righteous God. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Talim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away and leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. You showed kindness to the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Y'all still with me? We almost done. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He was told to utterly destroy everything. Y'all remember that? But Saul took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. You were told to destroy everybody, from the king to the cattle. But Saul decides, I'm going to take Agag alive. Now, we can speculate why he did this. He just showed the Kenites some mercy. You know what? This ain't got nothing to do with y'all. Y'all was cool. Y'all can leave. So they leave. But now, Saul, maybe he has some type of pity in his heart, some type of mercy. Maybe Agag was cool to him in the past. We don't know. It don't matter. What matters is what God said. The word that God gave Saul by way of Samuel. Now, remember, 1 Samuel highlights selfishness. How? Because 
Eli's sons were wicked. Along comes Samuel, the next priest, and his sons were wicked. So now the people said, we don't want, we don't, we don't want your sons as our predecessors. We want a king like everybody else. Not what you have provided for us, God. We want what they got. Samuel like, y'all don't want no king. The king gonna tax y'all and overwork y'all. We want it. We want it. We want it. We, I, I want it, I want it, I want it. Sometimes we can be so childish, childishly selfish to our own detriment. But God is so good, I'm going to let you have it. So we show our selfishness in wanting to be just like everybody else. So Saul shows his selfishness because the first time we see Saul, he's tall and dark and handsome and, and, and he's humble, right? Saul, Saul is like... You about to choose me as king, but I'm from the smallest tribe of Benjamin, right? So when it's time for him to present himself, he's hiding amongst the equipment because he shows, as a, as, as, as a good leader, his humility. But you know what? I'm going to tell you all something, man. Success sometimes is the worst thing for us. We don't want to hear that. And we wonder why God tells us no or not yet. Right? Because the things we ask for will kill us. So some of us start off very humble and very loving. And then God blesses and blesses and successes and successes. Blesses on blessings on blessings on blessings. And next thing you know, you forget about God. That's exactly what happened to Saul. Now, now keep in mind, God predestined all of this. So God knows Saul's heart, his ways, and his destiny. But God is about to relate to us in human form just so we can get the picture. But Saul loses his way like some of us do. Some of us, when we don't have nothing, oh, how I love the Lord, because God is all I need. Soon as you get a promotion and a bag and start getting some fame and people know your name, you forget about God. Now it's about me. Now it's about me, myself, and I and what I have done. So now we see Saul in the throes of his success. Because in the last chapter, in chapter 14, it lets us know that Saul, Saul was always at war with the Philistines at all times. But he was victorious because of God. Right. So that victory went to his head. Yeah, you know what? I am him. I'm him. I'm that guy. I'm that ninja. And that was the explicit version. Or the clean version. Some of us feel like that. Yeah, you know what? It's me. I did that. God gave Saul a chance to pledge his allegiance. To show his faithfulness. This was a test, Saul. All you had to do, you had one job. I gave you the victory. Go and destroy everything. Y'all ready? Because I see a lot of y'all falling asleep. It's okay. Saul said, Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havila to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag of the Amalekites alive and all his people he de totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag. I want you all to see the nuance. Saul took the king alive. And in the very next verse, it says Saul and the army spared Agag. Because see, the people follow the leader. This is oftentimes why we got in trouble as a community, right? Because we did what the leader did, and God would hold the whole congregation responsible. Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle and fat calves and lambs. Everything that was good. They were unwilling to utterly destroy or completely destroy but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. So now, God, I know what you said, but I'm 
I'm gonna just put this in my pocket. I'm gonna just. God ain't gonna, he ain't gonna miss this. They don't need this. That's nice. They were unwilling to destroy everything that was despised and weak they destroyed. Who are you to determine what's weak and what's worthy? Who are you? I'm God. I got everything you need. See, when we start going outside of God, we start getting caught up with stuff. And see, when we go outside, the further we move away from God, the more we get caught up with stuff. The more we get caught up with self. The more we get caught up in people and culture. That's why God's word has to be preeminent. I got three more verses for y'all and then we can go. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul the king. God tells Samuel that I'm sad. I'm grieved. In other words, this hurts my heart. Oh, but God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Well, guess what? God feels like we feel. Because we are made in his image and likeness. Therefore, he gave us what he has. Now, God knew Saul's heart way before Saul was even in existence. He knew what would happen, but he still gave Saul a chance to prove himself. So Samuel is recording and giving us a small glimpse into God's godliness by letting us understand this in human terms. I'm grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Church, the message. God is sad when we turn away from him and when we do what we want to do. God is grieved when we turn away from his word and live how we want to live. I don't have no other way to fancy that. There's no way to preach that other than to share it where God said, I'm grieved that I made Saul king. When Saul started off humble, he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. And it's not so much the fact that he he, he messed up. It was his response after he messed up, Namah. Not only did God say, I'm grieved that I made Saul king, but look at Samuel's heart, the prophet. Samuel was troubled also. Samuel was grieved because God was grieved. And Samuel grieved because of what Saul... Church, do you know what hurts me to see you out there sinning? Does it hurt you when you see me out here losing my mind? Or does it... Oh, oh, look at him. Look at him. We, We knew this whole time, Right? Are you that calloused in your heart where when you see your brother or your sister struggling, and and, and I mean struggling through it, Satan just has them. Well, that's what they get. They brought it on themselves. Well, check your heart. All right. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul is going to Carmel. This is why we know Samuel completely lost his, how do old people say it? How old people say it? You didn't lost your everlasting rabbit. You didn't lost your good mind. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul had gone down to Carmel. There he had set up a monument in his own honor. See, I was watching that Barry Sanders uh, documentary last night, right? And they gave him a statue in front of the the stadium, right? Saul said, I ain't waiting on y'all. I'm going to build my own statue. I'm going to retire myself. (laughs) Now, keep in mind, this is on the heels of sin. You see why God had to reject him as king? 
I kept Agag and some of the spoils. And you know what? I feel so good. I feel so good about it. Let me go, Brother Dukes, and make myself a monument. Not build me an altar to God. Let me build a monument to myself. He has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. I don't know what else to say. Let me just read two things for you. Bishop, I had it for you, but I'm going to get it. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 through 19. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt? You know, Deuteronomy literally means repetition of the law. So let me tell you again, because a lot of times we forget. This is why our parents had to tell us stuff multiple times, and most of us still didn't listen. And then you find yourself getting older and repeating yourself. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt? When you were weary and worn out? Y'all know we sing that song. I am tired, weary, and worn out. Remember what the Amalek, remember what the ops did, the enemy did when you was at your weakest? You just came out of Egypt. They met you on their journey and they cut off all who were lagging behind. Y'all see that? In other words, they they caught you slipping. And you know who they caught slipping? Those who were weak, straggling, those who were malnourished, those who were young and immature and inexperienced. Because, see, somewhere along the line, I know that the scripture tells us the devil is like a, a roaring lion, right? Seeking whom he may devour. And y'all know how the lions do, right? The, the lion is called the king of the jungle. First of all, lions don't even live in a jungle, Right? Lions, lions live in a safari. Tigers live in the jungle, right? We got this all messed up, right? And tigers will really whoop a lion, right? Just, just facts, right? But the lion doesn't go head up with an elephant. Lion doesn't go head up with a rhino or a hippo. A lion, lion, lion king didn't mess y'all up too because them hyenas would have told Scar up out the gate. But lions don't even go up against hyenas or wild dogs. You know what they do? They wait for the wildebeest to cross, and they wait for the little straggler that can barely get across, and they go and attack. They wait for the little zebra. They wait for the weakest, smallest, the most vulnerable. And that's how Satan does you. So God is saying, remember what the Amalekites did to you? When you were weary and worn out, you had you didn't cross the red. You came out of Egypt. You crossed the Red Sea. You was weak. You was tired, right? That, that's some of us right now. We tired. That food that settled in on us right now. That I is still kicking in, and we're still dozing off. So Satan has room. But see, the the work ain't even here, right? This is just one hour and a half during the day if you make it. He gets you caught up out there. And then you think, well, 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 I made it to church, so that makes up for what I did out there. It don't. That's how you keep us. I think I'm preaching. Need this more. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt? When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lacking behind? My goodness. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies around you in the land he has given you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. This is Deuteronomy. 400 years later, Samuel, go tell Saul. I ain't forgot about what the Amalekites did. It's time for them to pay. And I need you to, look, God said, I don't want you to spare nothing. They got to pay for what they did. I want their whole existence wiped off. That's how serious God takes. That's how, that's, that's how, that's how, that's utterly destroying in the text. I want this, I want their whole lineage 
erased from history. But Saul said, you know what? I got a better idea. Let's just take the king and let's take the goods. Right? So God is like, man, this makes my heart heavy. I got to reject Saul as king because his heart ain't after mine. So Samuel shows us, you know what? I'm, I'm set. The Bible says Samuel cried all night. He cried all night based on what Saul did. Because what God had to do, because he rejected him. And, and you know what? This is, this, is, this, this is chapter 15. What happens in the next chapter? God said, go get me a king from the tribe of Je- from go, go get me one of Jesse's sons who's out there herding sheep. Saul started off the same way in the mind. He was herding donkeys. He was just tall and handsome. I could stay there for a second. Because sometimes we want what's pretty. We want what's appealing to the eye. Never mind what God said. It looked good. So if it looked good, it must be good. Oh, we go all the way back to the garden with this. Right? He made every tree pleasing and, and, and acceptable to the eye. So sometimes we get caught up in the look. Can I talk? He was a jerk, but he was tall, dark, and handsome. She was so mean and crazy, but she was thick. Come on now. I hate this job, but it sure do pay well. This car is giving me nothing but trouble, but I got me a Range Rover. We can run it. We get caught up in what look good. Here's the moral of the story. And I will close with this last verse. Ezekiel, chapter I'll go home and enjoy y'all leftovers. Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weighed us down. And we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Verse 11. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Again, turn. Turn. From your evil ways. Why will you die, house of Israel? See, we think, you know, in our sophisticatedness, we think, well, I ain't out there stealing, killing, robbing, hurting nobody. Right? We, we equate it like we do the law. Right? This, this is a victimless crime. You know, God don't look at it like that. Right? God say, man, did you, in, in, did you obey my instructions? Because I, I, I gave you clear instructions. Right? And you disobeyed, oh, grieves his heart. See, so the question is, well, it's not what I'm not doing because we think we're faithful and good because of what I'm not doing. Remember that parable? I think the, the tax collector and, and, and uh, the parable of the tax collector and, and who else was it? He said, I'm glad I ain't like Brother Dorton. I don't rob people. I don't extort people. The tax collector, like, beating his chest, won't even lift his eyes up to God because I'm tired and I'm weak and I'm worn and I'm weary. I'm tired of this. But see, we get self righteous. We're so busy worried about unrighteousness and what everybody's doing, you forgot about self-righteousness. 
Yeah, I don't do that. How could they? How could she? I used to. I'm off that. Watch yourself. Because that self-righteousness is just as condemning. And God will, God, God will take action the same way he did with Saul. Because Saul refused his instructions. Now, I don't know what the message is for you. But God remembered the Amalekites for what they did 400 years ago. Y'all need to know, time don't erase consequence. See, we, we think, oh, wow, you know, statute of limitations. See, it don't work like that with God. I'm going to remember this. It may not come in your lifetime, but 400 years later, Saul, go take care of something for me. Now, what you, that was 400 years ago, man. We, 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 way down the line. Well, guess what? When it comes to sin, time don't escape consequence. This is why it is important for us to repent. This is why it is important for us to take the blood of Christ serious. Because the blood of Christ is the only thing that can atone for sin. And outside of Jesus' blood, if I don't repent, then I have an open case. And I might think, oh, it's been five minutes, it's been five years, it's been five weeks. Look, man, God, hey, this was 400. Huh? If I think, well, I escaped that one, woo! I made it home safe, I made it to base. I told you I would run home and think I would hope to die. My parents forgot what happened. And one time I got away with it, brother, brother of mine. I went down to bed, I went to sleep at 4.30 in the afternoon. No, I wouldn't sleep. God, don't forget. So I don't know where you are. Repentance is one of the most beautiful things in this walk. God wants us to recommit and rededicate our lives back to him daily. If you know you are in the middle of doing something or you've got something uh, planned and predestined to do, right, premeditated, repent. I don't know where you are in your life, but, man, it's time to repent. It's time to come back to the Lord. It's time to give yourself to him fully because partial obedience is disobedience. See, Saul, Saul, did, Saul, Saul went and attacked the Amalekites. He did what he was supposed to do, but he just tucked a little bit back, right? This is no different than Ananias and Sapphira, right? Where the Bible says they kept back a portion, right? That word kept back meaning what? Misappropriated. They misappropriated the offering. Achan went and saw the gold Babylonian uh, garment and the shekels, and he kept back some, and his whole family died because of it. So partial obedience is disobedience. I don't know how you need to respond to that. If you're here this morning and you have not been added to the body of Christ, it's time for you to acknowledge Jesus as the Son, as our Savior, as our Lord. And you need the blood of Christ to atone for your sins. How do you do that? I got to be baptized for the remission of my sins. Look, I got to be baptized for all that dirt that I did, right? And then I can stand before God, a new creature, and now his blood, the blood of his son, covers me. No, this is not a free pass to sin, not at all. Shall we continue in, uh, uh, he said, shall we, shall we therefore continue in sin that grace may abound? No. But when I have a repentant heart, oh, I can get right with God right then and there. I still might have to deal with the consequence. I got caught stealing on my job, Lamont. Oh, but God forgives me. Okay, but turn in your time card. They might press charges on your behind. But God forgives me? Yeah, he do. Make sure you strengthen your relationship in jail. Oh, it's funny, but it's true, ain't it? At the end of the day, God is our ultimate judge. Right? <laughs> I want to be judged. I want to be on the right side of that judgment. Yeah. Right? I don't. Stand on your feet, church. No song. No announcements. God said, I take no pleasure 
and the wicked when they die in their sins. I want everybody to turn and again, turn and repent. If you're here this morning, this is your opportunity amongst us. Right now, God is working on your heart. The Spirit is working on your heart. Let the Spirit have his way. Let God have his way. Let the Word have his way. All the prayer requests on Zoom, on Facebook, on YouTube, we're going to lift those up. This is the closing prayer right here. See, some of you guys, some of us, some of us, right? Some of us are barely holding it together. And, and, and I don't know how people do it without God in the mind. I don't. Because I, I'm tapped in with God all the way. Am I perfect? No, but man, I'm tapped in with God and I'm barely making it. I'm tapped in with God and I'm barely holding on. Like, I'm literally like, man, I'm, I'm on the verge of doing something regularly, daily. And then I, the Spirit checks me. That's warfare. It's warfare out here, y'all. I know we're very convenient, right? We can choose. We have the power of choice in this country. We choose what we eat. We choose what we wear. We choose. But see, if God ain't your first choice, all those other choices mean nothing. God is wanting us to choose him from our wholeness and our brokenness. That's the type of God we serve. I don't have to be 100% brolic, fully strong to choose God. I can be on my deathbed and choose God. I can, I can have all the, 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 the weight of the world on me, and my God has my heart. So I don't know the message this morning. Man, God said, I got to get rid of you, Saul. I got to get somebody here whose heart is after me. And you know what that means? What pleases God pleases me. What makes God happy makes me happy. What God says do, I do it. Is it always easy? No. But guess what? It's always worth it. I'm telling y'all, man, there's times where I I wake up in the morning and I leave the house and it's getting colder. And I'm like, I don't feel like going to this gym. And then I get to the gym and there has never been a time, Brother Dukes, where I went to the gym and walked out feeling, why did I come here? Sometimes I'm like, man, I I hope the mind ain't here. Try to get in and get out. <laughs> and then there's days I'm like, Lord, please let the mom be here. I got I to gotta talk. I got, I got, man, I got to share. That's how it works. Some days it's easier than others. Some days it's a struggle. But where's your heart? Where's your heart, church? Not where's your stuff. Not where are you physically, geographically. Where's your heart? Because that's what God wants. Father God, we submit to you. We choose you. Father, we love you because you love us first. Be with us, Father, from this moment forward. Help us to walk in your ways and your word holistically. It's not about being flawless. And it's not about making excuses. It's about hearing your word hearing your instructions, and obedience, because you require obedience over sacrifice. So as we leave this building, we know we are going back into the world, into the streets. We are going back into the playground where the devil runs rapid. But, Father, we take with us the protection and the armor of you, the helmet of salvation, Lord God, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, feet shod with the gospel of peace, along with prayer, Lord God. We're walking into this world strapped up, geared up, because the devil is trying to sift us like wheat any moment he can, and he will attack in our most vulnerable moments. So be with all of those right now who are going through things and are in a very vulnerable state, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, We pray for strength. Those who are going into surgery, recovering from surgery, those who are in treatment, those who are in recovery. Father, we pray for all of the saints, wherever we are, whatever state we're in, give strength, give healing. Help us, Father God. There's not a time we don't need your help. We bless you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. 
We close this prayer, Lord, and we close this service. As we go home, bless us with traveling mercy and grace every way, every direction, all day, all times. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless everybody.